Let me calm down. Get your Bibles. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I feel the presence of God up in here today. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We do honor the Lord for our bishop. Yes. yes. I praise God for our bishop this morning. Yes. God for our awesome first lady who's yeah, standing beside yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, God. To my colleagues in the gospel, yeah, and ministers and elders of this church. Feel like preaching this morning, y'all. Uh, I feel like preaching. Yeah, God. Hallelujah. Look at Luke chapter number six. Luke chapter number six. Starting at verse number six. I've got to be kind of brief this morning because I've got to be overseer this afternoon. I've got to go down to Atlanta. Our church in Atlanta is having their church anniversary and right. overseer's got to be there. Yeah. So as soon as I leave the pulpit this yeah. morning, I'm going to be heading straight down to Atlanta. So y'all pray my strength. Amen. But I'm going to preach while I'm here. Preach. Preach. Is anybody, anybody ready for a word from God? Yeah. All right. Luke chapter number six, verse number six, and it reads, and it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand, somebody say right hand, right was, hand. Withered. was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, rise up. Stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And looking around about upon all of them, he said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Yeah. Father bless your people as we receive the word of God today. Yeah. I pray that our hearts will be ready to receive what you would say. See my lips with your words. God, clear my thoughts so I can flow in exactly what you have. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Look at somebody and tell them, say, Neighbor, neighbor, I refuse to live. I refuse to live. With him. Or if you will, you can put it like this. Tell them not another day. Not another day. With a withered hand. With a withered hand. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have a talk back church with me this morning? Okay. I just wanted to make sure I'm in the right place. One thing that's very interesting to me, ladies and gentlemen, is that God is very deliberate. He is very, very deliberate. When he makes things, when he does things, he does them, Brother Steve, on purpose. Yeah, yeah. And he does it with purpose. Yeah, yeah. I find it interesting that when he made a giraffe, he made a giraffe with purpose. Yeah, yeah. He gave him a long neck so that the giraffe can stand up high and eat from the top of the trees and so he can see danger from afar off. That's why he gave the giraffe a long neck. Ah, when I think about how God is so deliberate, he made the lion and he gives him two to three inch canines and gives him these sharp teeth and powerful muscles and gives him claws and, 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 and gives him sharp wits and good eyesight. All because they are lions and they are carnivores, so they have to eat meat, they got to catch it. So God, in all of his providence, knew how to put it together to make the lion be a lion. Yeah, yeah. It's so amazing that our God is so purposeful in what he does. Y'all know he streamlined. You know, we got two cats. You got the lion and then you got the cheetah. The cheetah's not built like a lion. The cheetah is built streamlined. With, and his tail is used for a rudder. And it allows that cheetah to be the fastest land animal that we know on the earth. That God made the cheetah that way. Gave him a larger heart 
so that when he's running, he can pump more blood through his body to sustain him as he runs. Yes. God is purposeful in what he does. Yes. 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 Everything God creates, he creates with purpose. And not only does he create it with purpose, but he creates it for a purpose. And even when he created mankind, he created us with purpose. Mm. How ah, we are built because of God's plan. I find it rather interesting. I talked about three animals, and each of them are what they call quadrupeds. They walk around on four legs. But when God decided to make us, he didn't put us on four legs. God decided to make us, and he gave us two legs and two feet on which to stand and on which to walk. God was purposeful in what he did. We find that just about every animal in the animal kingdom operates primarily off of instinct. That's all they do. When they mate, when they come together, when they do different things, they operate off of instinct. They come eat at a certain time off of their instinct. Human beings are the only animal listed in the world that actually has what they call free will. And we can make our decisions by our free will because God made us that way. I'm grateful to God for making us with purpose and for building us the way that he did. Mm. He gave us two legs, two feet, and then he turned around and gave us two hands. Y'all will help me preach it here. I, I, I feel my way up the hill, but I got to work for just a minute. He gave us two hands because he knew what we were going to have to work on, so he gave us hands to work with. He knew that he had a plan, Elder Fletcher, so he had to put us, give us what we needed in order to work his plan in the earth. But that brings us to our text. In this text today in Luke chapter 6, it is the Sabbath day. It is the day to go to church. And while they are in church, Sister Anna, while they're in church, there's a man there with a withered hand. I was on my way to, I was on my way to Maryville Friday night and God began to speak to me about this text. And I began to see some stuff. Now, most people, when they preach this text, Elder, they preach it from the perspective of how the religious folk were judging and looking to see what Jesus was going to do. But God began to show me so much in this text, it blew my mind. One of the first challenges we face as we deal with this text is that this man was in church but had a withered hand. Ah, yeah. But you know what I'm grateful about was that the man, despite his uh, his capabilities or his lack of capability, it did not stop him. It did not his embarrassment of his issue did not stop him from coming to the place to hear the word of the Lord. Too many times people they get discouraged and they stop coming to church. They don't want to fool with Christian folk because they got an issue and because of their issue they can't hide it and so now they feel embarrassed and they don't want to come. So he was in the synagogue on a day to go to church and watch this. Whatever his condition was, which in this case was the withered hand, it was not hidden. Y'all gonna help me talk right there. It was not hidden. Too many times we got stuff that we can hide, but the only way you can get a miracle is if you finally are willing to open up and reveal the fact that I've got a problem that I need some help with. Amen. God have mercy I got a problem I need some help with and the thing is everybody else is standing around looking the truth of the matter is everybody in that room that day probably had some kind of problem theirs just wasn't visible So this man, he's standing there, and while he's standing there, the Bible said he's there with a withered hand. He's seated in church. 
And I'll tell you how I know he was seated in a moment. But he was seated in the church with a withered hand. It's obvious that everybody could see his problem because it said that the, the religious folk were looking at him and they were looking at Jesus. They were looking at him and they were looking at Jesus. Jesus looked at him, so it's obvious that what he had was easily seen. He had a wither. He had an obvious problem. Mm. Now, can I work right here for a minute? Yeah, right. Right. Part of the thing here we have to deal with is the fact that this man had something that made him look deformed. Yeah. When you have something in your life that, make, that creates a deformity, it becomes an embarrassment to you. So a lot of times it gives you self-esteem issues. Come on, somebody. There are people sitting in here right now who are dealing with self-esteem issues because some aspect of your life is not normal. Maybe it was the way you were brought up that wasn't normal. Maybe it was the way you grew up that wasn't normal. Maybe you were a drug addict. Maybe you were an alcoholic and it was not normal. Yeah, thank y'all for helping me praise wasn't normal. And so it's embarrassing to deal with that which is not normal. But you know what blessed me about this text? Can I start right here? The first thing that blessed me about this text, Minister Lisa, was that Jesus was not intimidated by real life. I need somebody to get a hold of that right there. Jesus is not intimidated by real life, by real emotions, by raw feelings. He's not intimidated by any of that. But when I go a step further, another thing that makes me shout about this text is the fact that Jesus is not intimidated by the opinions of other people about you and about me. Amen. Because when things don't look normal to other folk, they got stuff to say about your life. And so Jesus is not intimidated and he's not governed by what they say about you. I thank God that his will and his plan has absolutely nothing to do with the opinions and the thoughts of everybody else. Uh, so I begin to ask myself a question. Because the Bible does not tell us, ladies and gentlemen, why this man's hand was with him. <laughs> See, when you start looking at text, you got to start looking at the nuances of the text. Uh -huh. The Bible doesn't tell us why this man's hand was with him. Now, I, I don't want to just relegate what I'm saying to a physical condition. Mm -hmm. What I need you to get in here today is that the withered hand is representative of some area of your life that is dysfunctional. Yeah. I need somebody to talk to me right there. It represents the place within our lives that is dysfunctional. Now, here's another interesting thing before I get into the depth of this one. I started thinking about the fact that one side of the man worked well. But the other side of the man didn't work quite so well. One side he could use freely. The other side he couldn't use so freely. Is there anybody in here right now that you got some areas where you're real good, everything's comfortable, everything's copacetic, everything is wonderful, you're grateful, life is good right there yeah. on this hand. Yeah. <laughs> on this hand, everything is all right. But on the other hand, on the other hand, some issues on the other hand. On this hand, family, things are going well, but on this hand, my bank account is in 
the right. Oh, come on, somebody talk to me. On this end, uh, my job is going well, but on this end, my children are acting crazy. On this hand, I got my right mind. On this hand, I get depressed sometimes and don't even want to get out of the bed. Oh, I can't get no help up in here. Yeah, some of us in here right now, on this hand, things are wonderful. But on this hand, things aren't working so well. So I had to ask myself, what could have happened to this man that would cause him to have a withered hand? Well, I began to think, and I thought about the fact that sometimes when a person, or I, I've seen people who work in machine jobs, and sometimes their hand may get caught up in a machine, or something may happen, or something may drop on their hand, and because something dropped on their hand, the, uh, the weight of that thing caused their hand to be damaged, and when their hand was damaged, it became withered because it couldn't get the blood that it needed in order to function. Y'all want to talk to me up in here? What I'm talking about is that there are some people sitting in here right now that you are dealing with trauma that has caused your dysfunction. Yeah, ah, here's how you know I'm talking about you because you say things like, I didn't ask for this. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Because something traumatic happened and since the traumatic event in your life, on one hand things have been good, but on the other hand, things have been drawn up. Am I talking to anybody up in here today who has experienced some trauma? Maybe that man walked out the door and left you. Maybe that woman walked out the door and left you. Maybe mama dropped you. And so now you're dealing with a with a hand. Mm. <laughs> trauma can cause a withered hand. But as I began to go deeper and think about that thing, ladies and gentlemen, I began to think about the fact that you can be underdeveloped. Oh, help me preach, Holy Ghost. You can be underdeveloped in your life, and it can cause you to have a withered. Have y'all ever seen, and I'm not trying to make fun of anyone who's underdeveloped, but have you ever seen people who came out too early, and one of their hands works just fine, but then they have a whole other side that's not probably functional, it didn't develop all the way. There are people who came out too soon, and because they came out too soon, they came out underdeveloped, and so their hand is withered. God have mercy. I came to tell somebody, many of us are trying to get out of our trials, out of our hardships, out of our troubles, and God said, I can't bring you out just yet, because this is the incubator. This is the thing. This is the womb that I'm using to develop Develop you so that you can come out fully formed. Let's go. Watch this. Watch this. And so, when a baby is in the womb, it doesn't start off big. That's right. The baby starts off as a few cells and then it multiplies and multiplies until it becomes an embryo and then it keeps growing and it keeps growing. And the thing is, oh Lord, I'm going to preach to somebody right here because when it started off, where you are right now didn't feel like you were in a tight place. But when you start to develop and when you start to grow and when you're getting close to the place of being delivered, when you're getting close to the place of delivery, it's going to become a tight place. I feel like telling somebody that you might look like you're in a tight place, but it's because you're getting closer to the moment where God is about to bring delivery. It wasn't tight when you started, but now things have gotten tight. Oh, I can't get no help. I can't get no help. You went into, you came, you started out your life, everything was wonderful. You were serving God. Oh, God, have mercy. You were serving the Lord. And it seemed like before you could even think about a thing, God was answering the prayer. But now, he's letting things get a little. <laughs> oh, am I talking? 
happen to anybody up in here. You're having to wait a while. Things are getting a little tight on you. Oh, I came to tell you, don't get discouraged if you're in a tight place right now. It's a sign that you are in the development process. And the natural inclination of us is to want to come out because we're in a tight place. Yeah. And we shout because preachers get up and tell us, oh, you're coming out. Yeah. We dance because preachers tell us, you're coming out. Uh -huh. We holler and we scream yeah. because it gets a little tight up in there. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we get excited that we are coming out. But ladies and gentlemen, what we ought to be getting excited about is that God is not letting us come out too soon. Yeah. Yeah. Take me through the entire process, God. Whatever it is I got to go through, take me through my process, Lord, so you can build character in me, so I won't come out dysfunctional, so I won't come out with a withered hand. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to come out with a with a hand. Yeah. So, I looked at this thing underdeveloped. There's a whole lot of believers who are underdeveloped. Yeah. <laughs> How do I know we're underdeveloped? Because when you have a withered hand, mm -hmm. it impedes your ability to hold on to things. Uh -huh. right. I'm not going to talk. It impedes your ability to hold on to things. Yeah. That's why you're living from week to week looking for your next word. Uh -oh. uh -huh. You're looking for your next word from week to week. Yeah. Somebody, every week you get preached to, you hear a good sermon, you hear a good word, and by next week you need somebody to give you something else. You barely make it to Wednesday because you're under. Yeah. So you can't hold on to what you just got on Sunday. That's why I encourage our church to keep your notepads handy, to keep your tablets handy, because there's stuff that you're going to get today that you might not need today. You might not need it until next week, but you need to be able to hold on to it. So when you need it, you got it. Underdeveloped. Lord have mercy. Under. Developed people don't even know we've been in church 10 years but can't quote three Bible scriptures uh -huh. except you know the, the pet Bible scriptures you know yeah. you know no weapon form we, we quote stuff like that the, the easy stuff we quote the 23rd Psalm the Lord is my shepherd I shall. we know how to quote that stuff but we've not gone any deeper than that we've been in church 10 years and we're Y'all not talking now. Underdeveloped. I'm challenging some people to go through the process so that you can be fully developed. Yes. Yes, then, after I thought about the underdeveloped folks, then I began to think about another condition that we have right before us. And that is a stroke. Uh -huh. Come on. Come on. Oh. A stroke will cause a withered hand. Y'all gonna help me preach it here today. Because somewhere the pressure got so high that when the pressure got too high, the brain couldn't handle it and a dysfunction happened here, so it affected all of here. There are people sitting in here right now. You are under so much pressure. And that's why I remember my grandmom and my granddaddy used to tell me, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Part of our problem is we don't take our burdens to him and leave them there. We pray about things and we take them back with us. We pray about stuff and we keep it with us. We worry about it. We get frustrated about it. We struggle with it. And it has taken us to a place where we're close to a stroke. Not just in the natural. 
Oh, y'all gonna talk to me up in here? Not just in the natural, not just that you're about to have a physical stroke, but some people have spiritually stroked out. Still coming to church. But barely able to make it. When you should be able to help some, the Bible puts it like this, when you should have, you should be teaching yourself. But you still need somebody else to keep teaching you. Y'all not going to talk in here. I'm not just telling you what the Bible said. You should be teaching by this point and you still under. Because of your stroke. Yes. So much is going on in your brain. Uh You haven't shifted. That's why the Bible says it like this. It says, exchange your yoke for his. Okay, let me let me do it exactly. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you may say, well, I've taken on the bur- the yoke of Jesus. And this thing ain't, ain't, ain't light like he said. Oh, yes, it is. Compared to the stuff that you would have to carry by yourself, your yoke in Christ is a whole lot lighter than things would be if you had to carry your stuff by yourself. Mm. So, God have mercy. Can I, can I just take my time and preach y'all this morning? Yeah. Because somebody needs this this morning because you're dealing with a withered hand. You're dealing with a withered mindset. Uh-huh. And you uh, have a stroke. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're only able to do just so much. Uh-huh. I began to think. I said, Lord, what's going on? With his withered hand. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, He said, Think about what I created the hand for. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons God gave us hands when it comes to the processes of life is so that we can grab a hold to things. Yeah. Come on, talk to me, somebody. So we can grab a hold to some things. But, 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 but. Not only does our hand allow us to grab a hold of some things, but it is the same vessel or the same vehicle that we use to push some things away. Oh, are y'all going to talk to me in here today? It's the same instrument used to push some things away. What's wrong, Long? Because there are some people in here right now, you got some stuff in your life that you really know you need to push away but you have difficulty pushing it away because some aspect of you has underdeveloped or stroked out you got a withered hand in your mindset you are withered you have a withered hand and so things you know you need to push away from you you really want to push it away but you find yourself grabbing after it because these are involuntary movements I'm talking to somebody in here you really know you should be letting some old stuff go but you're trying to push it away but you can't seem to push it because you don't have the strength to push it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I'm feeling you. You said, I really want to push it away, Elder. I really want to get rid of it in my life. I really don't want to keep this in my life. I'm trying to push it away, but I don't have the strength to push it away because something has happened in me and I've got a withered hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on. I'm married and I can't even connect to my husband or to my wife because I've got something that happened to me that has given me a withered hand. Oh God, you can't trust everybody. You walk around with trust issues and say, I don't trust nobody. Why? Because you've got a withered hand. Lord have mercy. People in this room, you don't want to be in the place where you don't trust people, but you're still struggling with your withered hand. Ladies and gentlemen, is there anybody in here that can look at some of the stuff in your mind, in your way of thinking, and say, I'm the one. I've got a withered hand. I got some, oh, come on, can I 
to preach right here. I got some memories that I can't seem to let go of. Every time I try to move forward, I'm trying to push these memories away, but I don't have the strength to push them away. I kind of push them away, but watch this. Something called muscle memory keeps drawing me back. Come on, come on. Uh, elder, I know you know what I'm talking about. I start talking about muscle memory. That's why even in sports like boxing, you have to train the person to do movements differently because our muscles over time develop what's called memory. And so they automatically go back to what they've always known to do. Uh -huh. Am I talking right, Elder? Your muscle, so you gotta be trained to do something different. Well, here's the problem: when you have a withered hand, no matter how much you try to stretch out, even if you can get your hand to work a little bit, no matter how much you try to stretch out, some of us in here, no matter how you try to stretch, you're dealing with something called muscle memory. Your muscles have been in this condition for so long, been in this position for so long. That no matter how you try to stretch out, no matter how you try to move it, you can't keep moving it because you're dealing with muscle memory. How many of us keep drawing? Oh, God have mercy. You stretch out, but then you draw back. Some of us in our giving, we say, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to do what God says. I'm going to pay my time. I'm going to give my offering. But then when you get done, you stretch out for a week or two, but then because of muscle memory, you... Y'all not talking. Every quarter, you, you do good for a little while, but after a while, you say, "I'm not gonna drink anymore. I'm not gonna smoke weed anymore." Preach, I'm, uh -huh. I'm letting go of my cigarettes now. I'm not smoking my cigarettes anymore. And so we say all of that, and we do good for about two weeks, and then because of muscle memory, we. <laughs> We draw back because of what we remember because we've been in this condition for so long. I got to hurry and get out your way, but I thank God for being God because one thing about it, when you're dealing, when you are really dealing with a, a, a withered hand, let me give you some examples of a withered hand. The spirit of depression can be a withered hand. People that struggle with anxiety, that can be a withered hand. Lord have mercy. When you're still holding on to old hurt, that can be a withered hand. The spirit of fear can be a withered hand. You can have a fear of failure, it can be a withered hand. You can have a fear of success, and it can be a withered hand. Oh, y'all not talking to me. Oh, feelings of inadequacy can be a with a hand. <laughs> hand. So, when I've got a withered hand, I struggle to hold things. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I struggle to hold things. Yeah. Some of us in here have difficulty in our relationships because we struggle to hold things. We can't keep a good job because we struggle to hold oh, things. Can't move forward because we struggle to hold oh, things. Mm. Can I go deeper? Yeah. Okay. Anybody want some more? Yeah. Okay, watch this. I'm trying to move up. You know, when you're climbing stairs. Yeah. And you're scared to try and climb the stairs because you struggle to oh, hold things. You can't hold on to the railing because you got to with the hand. hand gone. So you can't, what I'm trying to show you is you can't move up effectively because you're struggling to hold. Yeah. Yeah. I feel somebody in this room uh -huh. for a long time. You've been trying to go up, but in trying to go up, your withered hand has hindered you from making your climb. Yeah. Oh. I'm too old to try that now. I'm too old to learn a computer. I'm too old to learn how to do that. 
baby, you're not too old. Right now, if you keep saying I'm too old, you just dealing with your with the hand. But today, God wants to free somebody from your withered hand. I got to get out of here. And so the Bible declares that, and that people that, that are dealing with withered hand, a withered hand, number one, it, it can cause you to not be able to hold on. Number two, it can keep you from pulling things to you that need to come to you. A withered hand. Oh, Lord, I hear the Holy Ghost. A withered hand can keep you from bringing things to you that need to come to you. But wait. A withered hand can keep you from effective yeah. communication. Uh -huh. I don't know how to spell. I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how. To. So it can keep you from effective communication. Because if I tried to write with this pen like this, I may be able to get a few words out, Sister Rosalind. I might be able to, but they're going to look like scribble scrabble. And some of you in your spirit, you really want to be able to communicate more effectively. You really want to do things better, but things keep coming out. You get a word out here and a word out there, but ultimately it comes out as scribble scrabble. Yes. 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 Uh -huh. <laughs> and if y'all never noticed, people don't have much of an appreciation for Scribble scrap. Am I talking good right there? People don't have an appreciation for scribble scrabble. After, oh Lord, this is going to get good right here. After a while, if people try to get through your communication issue, if they try to decipher your scribble scrabble, they're going to get tired of trying to read your scribble scrabble, and they're going to walk away from it and say, I don't want to be bothered. I'm talking to some folks up in here who are dealing with a withered hand that has kept you from effective communication, and because you struggle in your communication, you say things like, well, I don't know how to say it, and you know, I'm not the that's the same thing. I don't really have a filter. <laughs> I'm just going to say what I feel. That's your withered hand. You can't always say what you feel. You got to learn. Oh God, I'm preaching to somebody right here. You got to learn how to filter your stuff through the ears of the Holy Ghost, through the heart of the Holy Spirit. You can't always say what you want to say to people because you can do more damage than you do good because you got to. I don't want a surgeon working on me who has a. Because if the surgeon has a withered hand, he's trying to cut one place and it's going to end up cutting another. There's some people in here. God wants you to be used to help bring healing to somebody, but you can't cut on anybody if you're walking around here with a withered hand. Preach, Preach. I can't cut on anybody if I'm walking around with a because I'm going to do more damage to you than I do good because I got a withered hand but now so watch this I can't grab things I can't pull things close I struggle to push the stuff that needs to be pushed away I struggle to push it away so stuff that could burn me Stuff that could burn me. Yeah. Instead of me being able to push it away, I can't push it away because I don't have the ability to push it away. And so many people are sitting here and you have been burned by friends, burned by family, burned by people because God told you it was time for you to back away, but you couldn't back away. You couldn't push that situation away because you had... Yeah. With their hand. Yeah. 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 But now, I gotta go. See, as I get ready to close this thing, ladies and gentlemen, I got so much more to say, but I'm going to leave it alone. But I need you to understand that at this moment, it wasn't really even about all the people that were in the room. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What was going on? I know Luke chapter 6 gives a lot of emphasis to what the Pharisees and all those folk in the room were going to say and what they were thinking. But the moment that matters the most in this text has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with the man who had a condition. Yeah, yeah. I came here today to preach to some people who are dealing with your with withered hand. Yes, 
Wait a minute. Before I go, can I give y'all one more thing? Yeah. Just one more that'll help somebody. When you have a withered hand, uh -huh. I need y'all to see this. We're going to pretend like this is a hole in the garden. Uh -huh. When you have both your hands, now everybody knows that when you use a hole, when you're putting a garden down, you put your garden down in straight lines. Uh -huh. am, I, am I talking good? Y'all yeah. know that you, you, when you do your garden, you've got to do straight lines. Uh -huh. That's right. But the problem is, when I have a withered hand, I have difficulty yeah, right. getting things straight. Yeah, yeah. Somebody in this room, because of your withered hand, you have difficulty keeping things No matter how much you try to put things in order in your life, it doesn't matter. You keep trying over and over and over again, and it seems like it's not working. You're having difficulty keeping things straight. So no matter how you try to dig, you're digging, but you're digging in the wrong places. You're, you're, you're using the hole, but you're using it in the wrong places. And because you can't keep things straight, everything is not working the way it's supposed to. Things are getting mixed up and twisted up because you can't keep it straight. But I came to preach to somebody who says today I need to get some things straight. I need order in my life. I need order in my life. I'm preaching to somebody in here right now. I feel you in the Holy Ghost. Hey, I need order in my life. Preach. Well, what's even more disturbing is I got my hole. I can't work it. But what about what about Deuteronomy chapter 6? Uh -huh. Around verse number 11. Uh -huh. Where God says to the people, I'll give you houses that you didn't build. You didn't build. Uh -huh. Come on. But wait. I'll give you vineyards. Yes. <laughs> you didn't plant. I got a problem here, y'all. Because when I got a withered hand, if I got a vineyard I didn't plant, I have difficulty taking in and holding on to my harvest. Some of us in this room, God has released harvest to our life. He has blessed us with different things that we asked him for, but we look around and the thing is gone because we couldn't hold on to it. That's why they say people who are millionaires who never had anything, they end up being broke within a few years at most Jesus 
now looks at the man and he gives him three commands. Most people don't pay attention to this, but there are three commands that are given in the text. Number one, uh -huh. rise up. Yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, oh neighbor, oh, neighbor. get up from there. Get up from there. If you're going to get your miracle, you got to yeah. learn how to reposition yourself. Yeah. If you're going to get your blessing, you've got to yeah. reposition yourself. If you're going to get your healing, you've got to reposition yourself. That means change the way you eat so you can get your healing. <laughs> Yeah. 
our time. You got a word from the Lord that it's your time to stretch out. You got to deal with the people problem. You got to deal with the psychological problem. Because in your mind, you're going to keep remembering this is the way I've always done it. This is the way Mama and them did. This is the way Grandma and them did. We've been like this. Can I talk like I feel it? I've been broke all of my life. So we operate from a broke place. But I refuse to operate from a broke place. Not another day in my life. Today is the day we stretch out. out. We're not thinking like broke people. We're not moving like broke people. We're not giving like broke people. Today is the day I stretch out. And the last thing you need to get in your mind, you got to deal with the people problem, the psychological problem, then you got to deal with the physical problem. Because the moment you decide I'm stretching out, you will deal with all kinds of resistance. Yeah, yeah. You will deal with all kinds of resistance, Sister Anna. When you say I'm stretching out, your body's going to say, no, you can't do that. When you say, I'm going to stretch out and pray early in the morning, your body's going to say, we're not used to that. I can't do that. But I hear God saying to the saints, stretch out. Well, I never really understand the Bible when I read it. So the moment you pick it up, Either you're going to get sleepy or you're going to get frustrated. <laughs> and so you draw back because you're used to this condition. You're used to letting Elder Long feed you. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I'm only with you once, maybe twice a week. I don't know any baby that you can feed once or twice a week and think they're going to be fully developed. These other ministers and elders in here, if they get up to preach, they only get to feed you once or twice a week. What you going to do in the meantime? You're not going to be able to be functional until you learn what it means to so what, did, what, did, what was all of this about today? I came to address some people who can look at your life and say, somewhere in my life, I'm dealing with a withered hand. But I'm not walking out of this place today. Are you talking next week? Today. I'm talking about Floyd, today, I'm not leaving here with the same mindset I've always had. Now, when I'm inclined to complain, I'm not going to complain anymore. I'm going to condition my mind to not complain. And what we do is we say, well, I'm not complaining, I'm just telling the truth. But you're telling the facts about a negative thing. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, Lord. Yes, sir. We're telling the facts about a negative thing. Yes, yes. And so you keep putting negative stuff in your atmosphere. That's right. That's right. You always complain about, I got to go to the doctor. I got to go here. I got to go there. This is bad. That's bad. Everything bad. Then, then bad. This is you. Have you figured out that when you walk around here and you talk good things, when you speak the word of the Lord over your life, have you figured out that even if things physically 
This, or situationally have not changed. Yeah. Something in you is better. Yeah. Yeah. Am I making sense today? Yeah. When we really start talking the word, uh -huh. that's what I really love about my bishop. Because yeah. no matter what he's been going through right. yeah. in his body, uh -huh. through this stroke, he has not said, I'm done. Uh -huh. Now he had a moment where he was ready to go home and die. He'll testify to that. But when God got to hold his mind, yeah. every time Bishop talks, if he's in pain, he says, well, I'm dealing with some pain right now. Yeah. But wait, he'll say, but it's part of my process. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 So yeah. here's where I can shout. First lady pointed it out today. While praise and worship was going on. Uh -huh. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. While praise and worship was going on today, mm. despite yeah. the hand yeah. that had not been working, yeah. our bishop was clapping. Yeah. Amen. Amen. With both of his hands. Yeah. <laughs> Out. 
Good God Almighty. Yeah. Is there anybody else that needs you need God to touch you? You need to come to this altar? You come on. But I got a feeling some folk got it while they were sitting in their seat today. Yeah. You walked out of here with a new mind, and I'm not walking out of here with a withered hand another day in my life. That's over. Habits are being broken. Not another day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Queen. That's it. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Elder Fletcher, if you don't mind, if you'll come and give the altar call and close the service, you can shut down Sister Paula. If you'll come and give the altar call and, and then, of course, we're sufficient to do whatever else we've got to do. I've got to go get